Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, June 1st, 2019. And uh, I've changed uh, things a little bit. I've, I'm going to call the introductory editorial, the weekly editorial, instead of the rant. Rant was a little bit too psychotic, maybe. But uh, I am going to continue on with my editorials. This week, um, I'm going to go over a few things. And it's going to segue into the main theme of this week, which is uh, a beginning review of the annual uh, In Gold We Trust publication that comes out every year. And this year's is pretty good. It's about 368 pages. I've started reading through it, and I will be going over some of the highlights later on. But I wanted to kind of get my editorial in, and it will segue uh, pretty seamlessly into the In Gold We Trust um, review. I've been listening to a lot of podcasts and interviews and discussion around something called modern monetary theory. And what I've seen is, is that, or heard, as one wag suggested, it's neither modern, it's not about monetary, it's certainly a bad theory. So I'm not going to get into the manifestations of it or the definitions. Um, you can read about it yourself. Certainly, uh, it's nothing new. Um, Ecclesiastes one uh, nine tells us that there is no new thing under the sun. Uh, human nature is the same as it's been in, you know, 2000 BC, 1000 AD, and in 2019. Um, we have the political class in the world that has as its number one priority to stay in power. I will get into that a little bit later, but one of the ways they do this, obviously, is to promise things to people regardless of how they can be paid for. Um, this has been the history of po politicians throughout uh, any time in history. I don't really care what anybody says. I mean, you're not going to sit here and tell me, oh, well, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton's better than Donald. I don't care. They're all the same. The kind of people that are attracted to lording over other people are not good people. Let me say that again. The kind of people, there's two, there's two kinds of people in the world, folks. There are normal people that want to control and build and change and make better their environment. Uh, building things, creating infrastructure, creating products, uh, collaborating with others to do things voluntarily to make things better. And then there's this small little sect of really damaged, psychotic, sociopathic personalities, these little bed bugs, these little worms that are damaged psychologically that want to come into power and control other people. And they're Democrats. They're Republicans, they're communists, they're socialists, they're fascists, whatever they call themselves, this is what they are. And what they like to do is promise things to people so that they can get votes, or even if they're in a uh, system like uh, Soviet Union or anything else, they try to use ideology, they try to control other people. So when they are introduced to something like modern monetary theory that basically tells them that you know if you issue debt in your own currency and you use your own currency you can never go bankrupt and you know this is just coin clipping from uh, back in the Roman times when the Romans emperors didn't have enough money to maintain bread and circuses and their foreign wars sounds familiar doesn't it they just started shaving the gold and silver coins of the realm melted them down and made additional coins. This is, of course, inflation. So, um, you know, what we've seen recently, and what I've observed, is that over the last 10, 15, 20 years, people, the average people, the uh, middle classes, if you will, the working classes, they're getting fed up. They're not seeing any net forward progress. It used to be that one generation would be better off than the previous generation, for the most part. And we've seen stagnation now. 
And so people are recognizing this. They're seeing that they're not making forward progress in their lives and their wages and their retirements. Uh, we've been through two or three severe financial crises, and the only people that seem to be benefiting are the elites and wealthy. And, you know, people are looking for change. We just saw that last weekend. We have saw several elections that have taken place where we've seen um, – Modi in India, who's a Hindu nationalist, uh, had overwhelming success in the elections. We've seen populist parties in the European parliamentary elections uh, did very well. Um, we've seen the collapse of Theresa May's government, and she's out now in the UK because she would not follow through with the Brexit initiative. We've seen all of this, and what we're seeing is people are reacting to their station in life. They want a change. But instead of looking internally in themselves and saying, look, I can't, I got to get out there and hustle. I got to go out there and do what's required. I've got to, you know, if I'm in West Virginia and they're closing the coal mines, maybe I need to move to the Gulf Coast where petrochemical is blowing up. Maybe I need to consider how to be a pipeline welder. Maybe I need to consider moving from Snack, Nebraska uh, to someplace else where there's actually work. People don't do this. What they look for is some politician or leader that's going to tell them what they want to hear and like this person's going to come down and you know personally kiss their life and make it better. What I'm trying to say is I'm not, I'm not bagging on these people. I'm not trying to dog them. I'm telling you what reality is and what we're seeing because how it leads to some things that are going to be, I think, actionable for investment and speculative purposes. People want change. People want to see themselves bettered. And when we see this type of behavior, we're seeing the pendulum swing from the 50-year post-World War II uh, methodology of liberal democracy, globalism, inter in integration, of economies, now we're seeing the exact opposite. We're seeing that unraveling around the world. And I would suggest that that will not be uh, positive for economies and financial markets. In fact, I think it's going to lead to a tremendous amount of volatility, as we saw this week and in the past several weeks, when U.S.-Chinese negotiations have broke down and then President Trump came out of left field with a tariff threat on the government of Mexico unless they stop the flood of illegal aliens moving up through Central America through Mexico. You saw what that did to the oil markets. You saw that what it did to the stock market last week. So you can expect more of this, okay? Um, volatility is going to be the norm. Now, I want to kind of go through some things because, like I said, it's segues. This is, not, this is all things that other commentators have spoke about before and most of you guys already know about. But I think it's instructive to review this because it goes to my thesis that you know, people in government are not your friend. People in, in government are looking to keep themselves in power and they have ulterior motives, which is to make sure that they stay in power and keep getting the uh, benefits of that power. You know, when we had the financial crisis in 2008 and the Fed cut rates to zero, this was a Wall Street bailout. Um, if you watch the movie The Big Short, you see people losing their homes, businesses. If you were around, you remember the news. This does not benefit the average person out in Snack, Nebraska, or middle of nowhere, South Dakota. It benefited Wall Street banks and the people that were politically connected to the politicians in Washington. You know, the Federal Reserve stepped in and, you know, just issued currency. You can just push a button on a computer screen. They didn't go out and bail out people's mortgages. They bailed out the Wall Street bankers. No one went to jail. People lost their homes. People lost everything. Retirements were wiped out. Um, 401ks took a hit. There was no bailout for that, for the average person. No one went to jail. Do you remember anybody going to jail? Remember uh, Angelo Mozillo, Orange Zillow? Look him up. I mean, I, I forget the name of the company. Countrywide Financial, I think. You see all these liar loans and, you know, people who didn't even have a job were getting, you know, $400,000, $500,000 mortgages. You know, ask yourself another question. You know, the Afghanistan war is ongoing since 2001. It's still 
going on? Why does anybody in Youngstown, Ohio care about this? It doesn't affect them. Anybody in Wheeling, West Virginia or Brainerd, Florida or, you know, Dalton, Georgia. I'm talking about small town, flyover, middle class, working class people. How does this benefit them? Who cares about it? Now, somebody, somebody's going to tell me in the comments that, well, you know, this is where Osama bin Laden and blah, blah, blah. Hey, the hijackers and the plane crashers, if that's what you believe, were all from Saudi Arabia and Egypt. They weren't from Afghanistan. Afghanistan is not even a third world country. It is a prehistoric country. Why are we there? What is the U.S. interest? When I say U.S., I'm not talking about the United States, us, normal people. I have no interest in Yemen, Syria, or Iraq. Why, why are we involved in these things? Do I care if the Kurds ever have their own country? This is between them, Turkey, and, you know, these tribal people that live in the Middle East. I, I don't care about them. They should be walled off into their 7th and 8th century manner of living, and, you know, the rest of the world can go on with being modern. And they can continue their cousin marriage and uh, their infighting and their clannish behavior. What, what interests do normal people here in the United States have in these places? Why are we having people there? You know, the defense or war budget for 2019 is $686 billion. We're running a $1 trillion deficit this year. $1 trillion deficit, and we're supposedly in boom economic times. Ask yourself a question. What's going to happen when the next recession comes? Are we going to have two, $3 trillion deficits? You know, the Association of Civil Engineers grades U.S. infrastructure as D+. We don't have better use of funds instead of rebuilding Afghanistan after we blew it up or these other places are going around the world telling people who they can buy oil from and throwing our weight around the world with the $686 billion defense budget. We can't rebuild our infrastructure. You know, you have Social Security, Medicare, state pension funds, all severely underfunded. If they were privately run, the people, the fiduciaries of those entities would be thrown in jail. You're not allowed to do what these people do in the pre private sector. If you're in the private sector and running a pension fund the way they're running these, these things, you'd be thrown in jail for fraud. You have hundreds of trillions of dollars, possibly, and unfunded liabilities, how's that going to get taken care of? Well, you know, that's where these theories come about of MMT, because you can have your cake and eat it too, because deficits don't matter. And, you know, we can forgive all the college loan debt. We can have a universal basic income because you can just print the money. Because, you know, a country that can print its own money, it doesn't affect them. You know, what's the, what's the marginal cost of a dollar if you produce it? half a cent, a quarter of a cent, but you can call it a dollar. You know, why do you accept in exchange for your labor or things that you sell dollars? Because you have, there's a confidence there. You have confidence in that uh, as a store of value and a medium of exchange. But if it's printed up like they print up baseball cards, the value goes down. And we've seen that over time. And if you do it, if you accelerate that printing, if you accelerate that ability, uh, then the value decreases. You have inflation. Inflation is not rising prices. Inflation is a rise in the currency. Now, part of the problem is, is that when we had all this money printing, we didn't have prices go up in consumer goods. And the reason why is because you had inflation in financial assets. We have the highest value, the bubble in everything, if you will, stocks, real estate, that's where all the money went. That's where your inflation manifested itself. The creation of all those trillions of currency units manifested itself in record stock market prices and record, you know, recovery in real estate prices and malinvestments all throughout the economy. I mean, we've recently seen it, guys, Uber and Lyft. I use Uber. I think it's really great. The company just came public with like a 30 or $40 billion valuation. It loses a lot of money. It loses a billion dollars a quarter or something. It's not viable. You know, beyond meat, okay, selling at 50 times sales, no earnings. Lyft, no earnings. All these companies, Slack, Dropbox, all of them coming public now, right at the top of the market, no earnings. Billion dollar valuations. 
You've seen this before. This is a manifestation of currency units being printed out of thin air. So what we're going to see is, I think, and what's really talked about in, the, uh, in Gold We Trust and really gets in depth in is, you know, over the previous t 10, 15 years, we've seen this manifestation of all this money printing and currency units being created manifest itself in an everything bubble except for consumer prices. Now, I think what politicians are saying, a lot of them is, is that, especially populist ones, is, hey, we have the majority of people being left behind. We need to, you know, embrace this new theory, which is not new, which is to move this uh, money printing into infrastructure spending, education, debt forgiveness, whatever their scheme is, universal uh, health care, and this will, you know, be channeled back in towards the little guy. And when you do that, you can print all these currency units, but the productive capacity of the economy is, cannot be increased as quickly. And therefore, you will have rising prices. And that's what I think we're at a turning point in what we're seeing. We're seeing it all over the world. It's not just in the United States. We're seeing this manifestation or this idea that, you know, you can just print money, you can just create government debt as long as it's denominated in your own currency, and you can just do all these wonderful things. And you're only constrained by, you know, politics and outdated ideas of physical responsibility. And we've seen this before throughout history. We are getting probably into the, this is, I think, going to be the blow off top of over the next 20 years as we get into this populism, nationalism, uh, these quackery economic ideas that you can just print money out of thin air and let the good times roll. I think that's what we're heading for. Like I said, I, I'm not saying political change. This is, this is not going to be changed politically. This is going to happen. This is a historical narrative that has played out many, many times throughout history. And there were other people in those times that spoke out against the irrationality and the nonsense. But, you know, people are going to get caught up in this because who doesn't want something for nothing? Who doesn't want the free lunch that's, if it's provided to them? It's all good in the, in the beginning, but you see how it can end. Look throughout history. Look at Weimar Germany. Look at Zimbabwe. Look at Venezuela. Okay? Gideon Gono, who was the in charge of the Bank of Zimbabwe, knew was a, is a Western-trained central banker. He knew that printing money was going to lead to hyperinflation, but didn't have a choice because it's politi politics in Zimbabwe at that time didn't allow for anything else. He knew it was going to lead to hyperinflation. So what? You do what you got to do when the politics are, are, are what they are. Now, getting into the uh, In Gold We Trust 2019, I really like this. I'm going to put a link to it in the show notes. I really suggest you look at it. Take some time to read it over the next several weeks. Chock full of information. I don't necessarily agree with everything that's in there, but it makes good points. And, you know, one of the things that it's talking about this year is trust. And what is trust? What is trust in the monetary system, in, you know, the media, politicians, science? All these things are deteriorating. And this is a chart here that they show um, trust in governments in percentage uh, change since 2007. It's interesting to note that if you look to the left of the chart, a lot of the former countries that were communist or socialist have a higher trust in government now than if you look at some of the countries to the right, which have less trust in government, which are your traditional Western countries. And I think that's interesting. Um, and I think you see a lot of the populism and nationalism in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet uh, bloc countries and the you know, general liberal uh, democracies uh, off to the right, trust in government has deteriorated. And why? L look at what's happening. Uh, problem after problem, no, no, um, no trust, uh, unmitigated immigration, uh, all kinds of economic issues, uh, stagnation, uh, polarization politically, these things are all manifesting themselves. So when you live in a society that has low trust, that's not economically positive. And that's one of the points that they make, that we have just this trust is collapsing throughout all of our institutions. Another thing I found was interesting in this chart here, it shows the... Um, 
gold reserves of emerging countries in tons. And you see Russia, China, India, Kazakhstan, Turkey, um, especially Russia and China. You know, you have the United States of America going around the world telling people who they can and cannot buy oil from, going around initiating regime changes all over the world, telling other countries, grown-up people in other countries, what they can and can't do, uh, threatening them with uh, sanctions when they do something that uh, the government of the United States doesn't like. And I can tell you quite frankly that people don't like this. They don't like being told what to do. They don't like being lorded over by the United States. And this is what's happening. You're seeing, you know, for example, say China and France um, exchange something. Uh, let's say that France sells some aircraft parts to, uh, or oil, or natural gas or nuclear material to China. And it's done, has to be if it's done in U.S. dollars, then it's subject to the SWIFT system, the bank tra this currency transfer system, and subject to possible U.S. government oversight and laws. And this is ridiculous. People don't want to be subjected to this. So I think what you're seeing is you know you've seen the Chinese and Russians and trying to co-opt other people in Central Asia and Southeast Asia into a financial co-prosperity sphere and setting up alternatives to the SWIFT system so that they can get out from under the United States and its, uh, you know, oversight. The United States is not the end-all, be-all in the world. And, you know, there's we're 330 million people trying to lord over, you know, 7 billion other people. It's, they don't like it. And whether you are in the right or wrong, you think you're in the right or wrong, they don't view it that way. So I look at these increasing gold reserves as a antecedent, if you will, to these countries eventually creating a alternative to the U.S. dollar. And, you know, once U.S. dollar hegemony is, is dissipated, the United States got nothing. What do they have, some air aircraft carriers? So you have two things that basically hold up the United States right now as the world power. It's military because you can threaten anybody with an aircraft carrier strike, and the U.S. dollar, forcing people to use the U.S. dollar for trade and then forcing them into uh, falling under U.S. oversight like in the SWIFT system. That's what they did with Iran. They've cut them out of the SWIFT system, and that makes it more difficult for them to trade their oil. Why do we have the right to tell Iran who they can sell oil to, and who do we have the right to tell India, China, all these other people that are net oil importers, who they can buy oil from. I mean, if you don't see that that is, you know, not a positive thing if you're in those countries, then I, I really can't get through to you. So this is why you're seeing gold being accumulated by these countries, because they're going to use it as a reserve count, uh, you know, to eventually possibly establish an alternative currency, alternative currency transfer system, whatever to get out from under the u.s system and being subjected to the u.s and its directives so another thing they get into in the in gold we trust there were some good quotes here that i i thought were excellent you know this first one's pretty good it says qe which is quantitative e easing is a stagflation machine for for market world where we've inflated prices for financial assets and crushed productive corporate growth. MMT will be a stagflation machine for real world, where we will inflate prices for goods and services and crush productive, productive private sector growth. This is MMT is the sovereign friendly justification for deficit spending without end. And that's what I think is happening. We're going to now go into this turning point where um, we're not even going to have any pretense towards um, trying to keep physical houses in order, try to restrain budgets. What we're going to say is, is that, you know, we are going to, you know, the president pushed through that huge corporate tax um, cut a couple of years, or, you know, a couple of years ago when he first came in, into uh, the presidency. And that wasn't paid for. The deficit, you know, like I said earlier in this video, the deficit now is a trillion dollars a year. And you did that at the end of a long economic expansion. That's the first time anything like that's happened before. That is MMT right there. That's a manifestation of it. You're going to have a bit, you know, on the, on the more corporate side, if you will. You're going to see this now even on the populist side. Every Democratic 
presidential candidate is talking about forgiving college debt, infrastructure spending, free health care, paying for the where are they going to get the money? Well, they're just going to issue bonds and and have the uh, fe- and have the central bank monetize it. That's the plan. And the MMT people have told them, well, if there's how are you going to do that in a already resource constrained economy? You're going to have inflation. So I think the low inflation that we've seen for the last 35, 40 years, the low interest rates we've seen for 35 or 40 years, when we still had some pretense of trying to hold our physical house in order, that's going to be thrown overboard. And that's not just going to happen here. That's happening around. It's going to happen all over the world. And we are going to see currency uh, manifestation, you know, transferred to the real economy. You know, people ask me, well, why? I had a huge argument with somebody about this recently. And the view was, is people don't understand how, why when the Federal Reserve and all these central banks printed trillions and trillions and trillions of currency units, why we didn't have inflation? Because it wasn't transferred to the real economy. Okay, Uh, central bank bought bonds from sovereign bonds, corporate bonds, all these things. That, do, that money did not get transferred to the real economy. People sold government bonds, or they bought government bonds, or they sold their corporate bonds, or their crappy real estate uh, mortgage bonds to the government, and they put the money in the stock market. That They've put the money into real estate. That's where the inflation manifested itself in pricing. Now you're going to see that turn when politicians start going out and saying, hey, you know, our sewer systems, our bridges are falling apart. We're going to start... You know, we're going to take, you know, even the president prior to the Mueller report coming out was sitting down with the Democrats talking about a $2 trillion infrastructure build out. Where was the money coming from? Well, they're just going to issue bonds and, and have, the, have the Federal Reserve monetize it. When you had a 3.2% unemployment rate, where are you going to get the construction workers? Where you, I mean, this is going to manifest itself in higher prices. That's how you transmit uh, to the real economy inflation. Because you'll be spending money in the real economy, buying resources, employing labor. If you want everybody to have free health care and give it, well, you know, there's only so many nurses and doctors. Prices are going to go up. Demands at hospitals will go up. I mean, that's how you transmit inflation to the real economy. And that's what we're going to see over the next couple of decades. We're going through a turning point now. I like what Paul Tudor Jones says here. Relative to financial assets, the... GSCI, which is the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, is at one of its lowest points in history. That has historically been resolved by commodities putting on a stunner of a show, stoking inflation. I wouldn't be surprised if that happened again, and neither would I. We've shown the chart, and I'll show it again later on, where relative to financial assets, commodity prices are at an all-time low. So the prudent thing to say is when or the setup, if you will, is that when they when the commodity prices have been this far uh, undervalued relative to equities in the past, we've seen a reversal. And I would suggest we're going to see that again. I don't know when it's going to happen. It could happen next month. It could take two or three years. It could take five years. I don't know. But I think it's going to change. You see the zeitgeist changing. You see the populism rising. You see these theories now that are nothing new re-emerging to justify the upcoming inflationary policies that we're going to see, i.e. MMT. I know I've shown this chart multiple times and you know relative to financial assets, specifically the Dow Jones, it, this chart shows it. I mean commodity prices are at you know almost an all-time low. They're severely, commodities are severely undervalued relative to financial assets. And what we've seen in the past is when they've been this low, you know, they can reverse. Now, look at the, in 2000, it was almost like a V-shaped change. But look at back in 1960s and 70, you know, it took 10 years for, for it remained undervalued for, for 10, 12 years. So that could happen again. I mean, like I said, this stuff isn't going to just change on a dime, but... What I'm saying is, is that the policies that I'm seeing being put forward, the ideas I'm putting, seeing being put, being put forward are going to manifest themselves if they are carried out in real-world uh, price rises because 
the inflation, the money that will be created out of thin air will be channeled to the real economy instead of the financial economy. So triggers for reversal from financials to hard assets. Um, in the report, they talked about MMT and weakness of a U.S. dollar. Obviously, the dollar is a little bit high right now because interest rates in the U.S. are relatively high compared to EU, which is negative rates, and Japan, which are negative rates. If the U.S. economy is coming up for a recession, you're going to see rates get cut. As a matter of fact, the yield curve is fully inverted now across the entire yield curve, except for the 30-year bond. So that's basically suggesting that monetary policy is too tight and that we will be looking at uh, an upcoming recession here very soon and that the U.S. Federal Reserve will be in a position where they have to cut rates and stop the quantitative tightening and reverse that and go back to quantitative um, uh, easing. So that's what we can expect to see, I think, in the near future, and that would not be dollar positive. Uh, when, do when the dollar's strong, it has a dampening effect on commodity prices. But I think that's going to come to a change here uh, in the next six months to a year. And the other thing I want to talk about is, like I said before, populism is rising around the world. Look at Brexit. That was three years ago. That was the start, and they still haven't got out. It, it caused the failure of Theresa May's government. You saw Nigel Farage's Brexit party uh, storm to the highest uh, win in the EU parliamentary elections in the UK, and the party's only five weeks old. People told the government of the UK, we want out of the EU, and they've been diddle-dallying for two, three years on this. People have had enough. They want out. They don't want to be part of this globalist, uh, neoliberal, post-World War II, uh, we're all Europeans, we're not uh, Englishmen or Frenchmen or Germans or Hungarians. We're all just citizens of Europe in this collective, uh, bureaucratic, ma uh, Mandarin-run thing from Brussels. People don't want to be part of this crap anymore. You saw the same thing with the election of Trump. You know, it's not about Trump. What is the, Trump is a vehicle of the manifestation of people being, felt like they were left out for 20 years, that everything is run from the coast for the benefit of the people on the coast and the elites, and that the rest of the country from the Nevada border to the border of West Virginia and Ohio doesn't matter, and people are tired of it. Trump's just a vehicle for that uh, manifestation of anger. So the focus, of course, by the elites is, well, Trump's a, you know orange man bad. They don't look at the fact, I, I've been in these small towns in the Midwest and in central parts of the United States. The people look tired, worn out. They have no future. It's not good. And that is what the real issue is. But as long as people ignore that and focus on orange man bad, you can expect to see you know, similar discourse going forward until the, until the politicians finally get it through their head. Look at the recent EU parliamentary elections. Okay, Who were some of the, the big winners? Nigel Farage's party. Brexit party has one issue Brexit okay national rally used to be national front in in France okay look at uh, Northern League in Italy okay these are all populist movements and they all did very well it's across Europe look at what's happening in Eastern Europe you have very populist nationalist parties it's the same thing in Western Europe as each election cycle they keep making more and more gains Look at what happened just in India. You had a Hindu nationalist party, the BJP, Modi, overwhelmingly crushed the opposition. You know, and look at what, you know, what's not goes unreported. It's been like five or six months or longer, or longer than that, seven or eight months. Every weekend, Yellow Vest protests in France, and it's not even on the news. No one talks about it. These are manifestations of people being fed up with the elites. They want a piece of the pie. And this opens things up for demagogue, demagogues and bad ideas like MMT and a free lunch because people will glom onto it. You know, you should read how, what the conditions were in Weimar, Germany, and you will see why the National Socialists were so effective in getting a plurality of people to agree with them because people were hungry, they were fed up, they were tired, they didn't like what was going on. They, they, didn't, they didn't 
No one was talking about exterminating six million Jews or starting a second world war. People wanted jobs. People wanted somebody to step up and create order out of chaos. And that's what the danger is that you can get in these types of situations. That's what you attract to these types of situations is demagogues and bad ideas. So we can expect more bad ideas. We can expect more chaos, more volatility, more inflationary policies. And I think this is going to be good for gold and commodities going forward. That's it for this week, guys. Thanks for listening. And uh, keep, keep supporting me. I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, if you don't want to subscribe to the newsletter, we have the Patreon. If you support me $5 minimum, I will send you the recent uh, actionable intelligence stock pick one month only. I will send you the, the current month's pick. And, uh, or if you don't want to spend any money and you're, you're a cheapskate, you know, just follow me on YouTube and on Twitter. Uh, that helps me out quite a bit also. Uh, so thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.